Uh, ben, can you tell us a little bit about the sports study program and what you, and what your degree entails? Uh, well, sports study itself is it kind of looks at sports from a bunch of different aspects. Uh, it is, uh, it takes a look from a uh, psychological aspect, social, health, economic, among many others. Um, I originally got into sports study program because uh, one of the coaches. And I'm also smart to allow that I'm teaching. I wanted to look towards different aspects to dedicate my life to sports. But I think this. Yeah. How important do you feel that sports has within the culture of the United States? And why is it so popular? Why are all sports so popular in some of the. I mean, if you want to look at the NFL and different leagues across the country and different sports, there's some of the highest scores in the United States. Why do you think that? Well, it's my personal opinion that it's like people they like to lose themselves in sports, and sports becomes an out. Even when you're growing up playing, sports is an out. You see how you have a lot of talent. And great athletes because they're going to take a life for something they are good at. And so I just think that later on in life, people tend to forget about everyday life and they find joy or in their team. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you wrote in my first edition of the Smooth Moon Journalism Magazine and wrote about the NFC East. Thing. With the uh, Super Bowl, well, it's going to be this weekend. The time it airs, it's going to be tomorrow. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Game? I'm really excited about it, actually. Uh, you got two very good defenses. It's just going to come down to does the old Peyton show up, or is it going to be the Cam Newton game? Like, my money would be on Cam Newton actually filling up play, but. You see how he shows up in a. You see how he responds to the big game atmosphere. Yeah. He's showing up. So he's showing up. So if that continues, uh, coming to Sunday, then I expect the Panthers to come out with a win. A lot of people seem to be kind of really lazy about this game. Back to the NFC East. No, um, well, I think it's going to be any advantage. I would probably give it to the Panthers just because they, uh, over the course of the season, they've always really uh, taken advantage of the turnovers. Uh, not to say that the, not to say that the, the Broncos haven't, which is Broncos have also committed more turnovers than the Panthers, so it's kind of easy. But uh, I, I definitely would give um, the Panthers defense a slight edge, but not by much. I, I think the Broncos' pass rush is better than the Panthers, but the overall defense is even from the Panthers. So. Yeah. 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 The most important aspect of this game. Field position. Um, I know it's all for these defenses. Field position is going to be everything. And with there's been a lot of and we're going into the more of the political aspect. But there's been a lot of attention around Cam Newton and his celebrations and his attitude. Not personally, I've been a little confused about some of the things because uh, Russell Wilson didn't get the, the same kind of treatment. So I, don't, I don't believe it has a racial aspect to it because this happened this past two years and none of these aspects were even spoke about because of Russell Wilson has a bit of a old school mentality that he approaches everything in life. Do you feel do you feel what Cam Newton does is more of a distraction? Do you think it's good for the team? Or what, how do you feel about his sometimes well, he likes to celebrate. 
fun to watch it back play football. I mean, they play with so much emotion, so much passion that it affects the camp. And I think the way that he plays, it just makes everyone else around him play better than what the actual ability is. And I think it's definitely unfair the way he's being categorized as a thug or any of those type of things. The way he should be described as a player. I think he's playing with a lot of passion, but he's having a lot of fun doing it. Sports fans are still look at sports with a little bit of a conservative viewpoint since that's the core of that position throughout time and our history that is there is a it seems there seems to be a I guess a default setting for how quarterbacks should act and how they how they should carry themselves. Like just a, I remember I believe this was the last season. Uh Colin Kaepernick got a big it was a big deal for such a that he wore his hat back. I was like, why are you, why are you doing that? Like, you made a big deal of that. Do you think that's overblown We're in a different society? And do you think there's a certain demeanor that a quarterback should have? Like, take for example, Johnny Manziel. I don't, I don't think, if your quarterback is doing that, it's a lot easier to say, I don't know, or center. Because that is all the attention to be on that position. Do you think there's a, do you think there's an argument there that the, that Cam's doing? What he's doing shouldn't be done for his position, at least. Well, I personally don't care what his position is. I mean, it shall be considered the same as all of them. Um, I think I never thought about this perspective until you brought it up, but the way some sports, uh, sports supporters are throwing around the bus for that reason, it makes sense. Um, but also, the new day, uh, new day and age, it's time for them to get to the book. Uh, for that. Um, can you ask the question again? Oh, it was just, uh, do you think that, uh, do you think it's a big delay he's doing it for his position? Or did that change, should have, should have basically should have put it back in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that as the quarterback, he's the leader of the team and the franchise. Uh, so if he's going out there and giving everything he's got and having you know, the entire team want to do the same thing. Uh, again, full disclosure, we're both Dallas Cowboys fans. And there's been quite a bit of, quite a lot of speculation, but mainly because it seems like anything in Cowboys end up doing as a bomb for the or something. And yeah. there's been a lot of talk about will the Cowboys either draft a quarterback or will they sign RG3 or Johnny Manziel since it seems like Johnny Manziel is his way out in Cleveland. Uh, what are your thoughts on that what situation with that quarterback? Well, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Dallas were to sign a, a veteran uh, back at quarterback while still drafting one. Um, I personally wouldn't like to see them draft a quarterback and still lead the third round. I think they have other issues that need to be resolved before you can think about quarterback. As far as RG3 or Johnny Manziel, I can see them in Dallas uniform, but I understand how Jerry Jones likes to make a, like to make a splash in, uh, yeah, during the offseason. So, I would not be surprised to see him bring either one in. If I had to choose between the two, um, I guess I'd really tough. They both aren't. I will say this though: the when Johnny Manziel was coming, that was the first draft I actually. Did some scouting on broke down table for that. I honestly had I put a third round grade on Johnny Manzo based off his playing ability, based off his attitude and being at the quarterback position. I put him as a, um, I put him in the box that some, some scouts would call it because I was like that guy. I don't want that at my position. That's a big distraction. 
seemingly that's kind of what played out in Cleveland. Yes, no, I we were afraid of in Dallas, I think we'll play out in Cleveland. Imagine if we could if uh, Jerry did get a win. Uh, but between Manziel and RG3, I would tend to lean towards Manziel. Just, you know, I think he, uh, he's better at extending the plays while keeping his eyes downfield with rather than RG3. He, he would rather just chase it. But if I had my way, we wouldn't take it. Yeah, I, I, personally, I, I don't. Personally, I would take RG3 combining the on field, and I don't. I think what the media did to him on field, kind of, well, some of that's in the uh, especially this past season. He could have made a lot. He could have made being third street football a lot bigger this year, but he didn't. Um, personally, I. I uh, I've, I've been saying this since like five minutes ago. I'm sorry, I'm going to call it something else. North Dakota State, like, yeah, he's a losing quarterback. And uh, I'm, I think a lot of teams will want to hold against him when he played in uh, the uh, F- FCS. But that North Dakota State, honestly, I, if I'm more in on my ear, this might not like it, but I'm pretty sure that team from the East Carolina has that team. That team's probably better than 70 teams in that BS. Like, that team's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> I mean, and he was a quarterback there. Like, he's one of the best quarterbacks I saw play all last night. I, I, I agree. Like, I would take, I'd honestly take him. But I don't, will the Cowboys do that? I mean, they got the coaching this week. So, or last week, so. <laughs> it's almost guaranteed that it's gone. I don't like that mentality from the coaching perspective. Because I think any quarterback that comes in the league needs to sit for a little while. Russell, I mean, they're so far ahead of the game coming in the pros that they took it down running. But largely, quarterbacks coming in the league need time to sit and learn and adjust to the, the speed of the NFL. completely because of, because of the style of offenses most colleagues now seem to be running or we want you to spread them out. Everyone runs the same route. Nothing changes. You just do this one thing. Well, don't even worry about reading this side of the field. You're going here or here. I mean, that's kind of basically that was held. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. The Baylor quarterback that came out last year. That was held against him. And any quarterback comes out of spreads like, and they get him in the they get him on the looking at the chalkboard. It was like, okay, safety does this. Safety does it. What do you read it? Uh, I came from a spread offense. I just looked to the here, here, and the ball was going over there. And, like, and I mean, that's basically what the spread is. I mean, do you, can you blame college coaches for it? No, they need to win. I mean, they, they got to win. So, uh, but the problem is, but the way the NFL is now, the way the NFL is now, it seems like quarterbacks need to be able to read a lot more and do a lot more things. That, like Russell Wilson's example is like, I thought when he was coming out, I was like, this, people are not giving him enough credit because he played at a uh, Wisconsin his final year in a uh, definitely more of a pro style offense and he had he showed the tools then she was like yeah this guy comes in I honestly didn't think he was going to start right away but I thought he was better than Ryan Tanning who was coming that same, same, same year but he came in he beat out a veteran uh, I can't remember his name at the top of my head he's in the Packers but he beat him out and they Seattle, Seattle paid him a lot of money wasted a lot of money I can't remember his name but when the Russell Wilson has proved to be, yeah, if you're smart and you play in a system that isn't spread offense and you have experience in it, you can come in and and maybe not be ready to light up the NFL, but you can come in and compete for a starting position. But most quarterbacks aren't going to be in in that situation. Carson Wentz played. It was a semi pro offense. You know, I watched a lot of games. It wasn't a spread offense by no means, but uh, so he might. He's not going to be quite ready to start. Right that, that's the problem. I don't. I would never want to say, "Hey, Carson, here you go. We'll start." No, don't. Do that. I don't think we should do that. Any We're almost still good, hopefully for two seasons. Uh, I'll give him this one season, and after that, he can last a second. And that's just great to give. You know, draft two seasons to learn this the offense, and I think he's going to learn three and. 
It would it'd be the same, similar to when Aaron Rodgers to go to Brett Favre and Green Bay. That was the best thing that happened to Brett Favre. Hey, you get to learn from Brett Favre for all these years. Don't you? <laughs> I mean, you get paid, you don't have to play, you get to learn an offense to succeed. It worked out quite well for him. I mean, and, and, there, and again, this year, it seems like every year was, well, actually two years ago, there wasn't really that much controversy until you got to the playoffs and you catch and not catch with the Cowboys. What did you think about the whole Greg Hart situation this entire season? That seemed to be, it was always in the news all the time. And then when he started playing, he got himself more into the news by those interviews he did. What did you think about that whole situation and the fact that he's now not going to be back? Well, uh, I guess I'm kind of glad he's not coming back because there's one less distraction that we need in the locker room. I think when he was on the field, he played. He played about the way I expected him to. He was a little rusty at first, but he, he, he still, he still solidified the defensive line. The big one did, was the defensive line's biggest problem was pass rush, and we were there to solidify that, even though we were expecting bigger numbers, I think, from maybe it was just as a fan. But I think that. Uh, and young prospects were able to learn from him, and I think I think the line can be better next year without him. Yeah, I honestly think there uh, it's up to what the front office does when it comes to draft. Because basically, with him not coming there, it was, it's basically it sounds like yeah, we're going to draft a defense line at some point, whether that's Joey Bosa or whoever. They're, they're probably definitely going to. Draft defense in to place him, even though his numbers weren't outstanding. He called, he did get a lot of attention, and personally, with what he did off the field and everything, that a lot of Cowboys fans would try to excuse. Whatever, whatever. I was never a fan. Like, to be honest with you, then when the season started building down, I was like, now everybody wants to talk about Red Party, and that's about it. Oh, Tony Romo's hurt, Cowboys season over. Let's talk about Red Party. People are and just, I, I don't like that anything from attached to that. So, I mean, he's going to sign somewhere, some team, and go, hey, we don't have a patch rush. We can pay you some money. Come play here. That, you know, probably, honestly, people would get small markets if they would get that to go up as much as before. If he's, I would say, a giant or something. Um, I don't know. I'm sure he's probably a patron. The patrons are and uh, we're going to move into uh, just a, a little bit more since we're going to have Cowboys fan. Well, if Tony Romo, how many more years do you feel like he uh, that does he have left? It, it is because he's one of the most criticized quarterbacks in the NFL. The numbers will tell you that's not fair, whether you're a Cowboys fan or not. If you look at the numbers, you can tell a lot of criticism saying that Tony Romo sucks is completely a false narrative. I mean, just look at the numbers for a even when he gets to his turnovers, he doesn't suck. So, how many more years do you think he has that where he can play at a high level? Yeah, like you said, unfortunately, Tony went to play for America's team where your stats don't mean anything. The only thing you're judged by is how many, how many Super Bowl rings you have. So, unfortunately, he has zero, but I personally think that he does have. Two good years left. As long as a falling injury, I think he has two solid years left. That was kind of a sad part about the games he played this year because I was like, oh wow, it's what he's playing really, really well. Count like, and I think honestly, for his reputation, this year did more for his reputation than anything else. Because games he completed, played the entire game, Cowboys were three and zero. When he went out against the Panthers. Uh, Game. So, I mean, so, I mean, I think this year there's like, yeah, the Cowboys went from 12 and 4 to 4 and 12, and the only thing different is really Tony Rumble. He really wants to break, break down into it. But what do you think that says about the rest of the team and the team that Will McClay put together? Do you think it's too centered around Tony Romo? I haven't even seen some of those. The Cowboys' offense is too Tony, uh, Tony Romo. Uh, Friendly, which I'm not even really sure what that means. He's a quarterback. I mean, you kind of want him to uh, 
nervous system. I mean, so I don't, I don't even understand where that nervous coming from or what it means for a, a system to be too free for a quarterback. That's what it's ridiculous. But what do you, what do you think this says about the rest of the, the team? Like, a lot of the games were competitive, but 4 12. Well, um, I think that Wilma Clay has done a great job of assembling talent, especially uh, as opposed to the way the Cowboys used to do things by just spending money, uh, just throwing money at free agents. Wilma Clay has actually done a lot of scouting and brought in uh, a guy, one of the bunch of guys that bought, that would normally none of guys that he can uh, <laughs> yeah, the kind of guys that will actually be able to produce and not be, uh, be a cap burden. Yeah, we've learned a number of guys that produce on a low salary. Right? Mm-hmm. And more often than not, it's a league minimum. But I think that the team was in a lot of the games, especially the first half, half of the season. Three or four of those losses were only by one possession. And that also that would come down to I mean, a lot of those games seem to come down to Brandon Wheaton being unable to make a play. Yeah. Well never thought Brandon Wheaton was the quarterback who wanted to uh, lead the game time drive. Even when he was in college I never thought he was that good. Yeah he I was actually shocked to see him win a game for the Texans. I was a little bit. It was against the Jaguars, so it was a guy I'm pretty sure he could beat the Jaguars and the Cowboys, too. So, I mean, I was a little bit of a But, I mean, yeah, it just seems a little bit – I mean, yeah, I was a little bit disappointed because I, I expected a – well, I, I was going to say I expected a lot more from all out from what he did. I, I thought he, could, he was good enough to win some games while Tony was out, but he – he played like compared to what how he played watching his film to seeing how Kellen Moore played. Brandon Wheaton played like he was playing his first game tonight. No, not Kellen Moore. Kellen Moore was like, I'm looking downfield, downfield, downfield. Nothing's open. Okay, I'll check down. Brandon Wheaton was like, I'm looking to check down. I'm not looking downfield. Okay, I mean that's it's really strange because if you want to compare arms, Brandon Wheaton's arm is he probably can throw the ball <laughs> 20 yards farther than Kellen Moore. I mean, it's like, but Kellen Moore isn't afraid to go down. I mean, he played like he did at Boyd. I mean, this is his first actual, his first actual uh, regular season games, and he he wasn't afraid. Brandon, we played afraid. Matt Castle at times played afraid. I mean, it it was a little disconcerting seeing that these are the guys that, I guess that's where quarterback evaluation is so difficult. Because Brandon Wheaton had experience. Matt Castle has a ton of experience. He's been to a Pro Bowl. And neither one of them, it might be a little bit unfair for Matt Castle since he had a couple of weeks, but neither one of them looked as good as Kellen Moore did. And, so, I mean, I guess that's why Corbin well, evaluates it. Under uh, Linehan for three seasons in Detroit, is that right? Uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he's pretty much any time he's been in the NFL, he's been a scout with Linehan out of the class. Yeah, so he was able to hit the ground running. He probably should have picked up the ball a few weeks before, but uh, honestly, in my opinion, as soon as they wanted to make the move away from Brandon Wheaton, I was like, "Can we just play Kellen Moore? Like, just, just yeah, just do well, it. it. <laughs> it's not not as easy from an offense standpoint to get the number two in favor of a, a quarterback that's leaving your scout team. Yeah, that, that, that is definitely that's definitely true. And my uh, last Cowboys question: What do you? What do you expect them to do in the draft? How do you what do you think the biggest needs are? Uh, the team needs depth wise because that seems to be the biggest issue right now is the depth. There. I mean, it's well, really hard to point out. So the team was so competitive in all these games. Like, what's going to make the, the difference? I can honestly point to very Church's tackling at times. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think. The first issue that we need to address would be our defensive front. Uh, I think we need a pass rush to, you know, compensate for the losing with Greg Hardy, but also to go for the future. We need somebody to stand opposite of uh, Gregory. 
who had a great rookie season in Oh, yeah, I think uh, Gregory and Lawrence, oh. they're going to be around for a while. If we get another pass rusher in there to just rotate between three, I think we'll be sitting pretty. And, uh, and I, I, I personally hope Crawford picks up uh, Tyrone Crawford and is a little bit more productive for his contract. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Uh, assuming we don't address our secondary and free agency, I would expect this to go uh, cornerback with uh, the second. Assuming we go defense uh, end first time, and then I would expect us to start addressing uh, our offense. Um, depending on which quarterbacks are there in the third round, I could see us taking a quarterback there or going with a. Um, a running back to compliment Nick Batten for the same time. Actually, I that. Uh, I also do think that we need another receiver to sound the offense because Terrence Williams is just not getting the job done. He was pretty much invisible whenever Dez was not on the field. Yeah, he's proved that at best he's going to be a uh, second. So he cannot. I'm not sure what exactly it is. It's sometimes it's his route running, sometimes it's the fact that he's his he's not fast enough to overly compensate for his his like not great route. It's not the greatest route. It's his route. So uh, he's not a number. He's indeed he can never be a number one. I don't know. I think everyone in the NFL knows that now. Uh, but I don't think they're going to be able to get anyone to compete with him. So that's that's one of my biggest problems. That's one of the biggest things I, I saw is that Dez isn't on the field and teams can concentrate on it and, and Beasley um, between the hashes, then everything else is one on one. And we always saw Devin Street well as uh, Nick Eaton would say it's KP can't paint play. Um Devin Street cannot Devin Street got outperformed by uh he can't do rice ball, didn't exactly light it up either. So I think wide receiver is a need that needs to come at some point. I, I can't imagine, unless they want to get negative on the he wants to sign a lot of players. I think, huh, that would be nice. Hey, Des, here's your, here's your number 10. Hey, Roman, it's the ball club. It's a one of them. Shit. That's what Matthew Stafford would be using people like to all <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, But yeah, that's um, it's, it's I, I don't expect him to go through the twelve. I don't expect the Reds to lose two. That was that was more uh, how bad the NFC is. But I agree with I agree with your your, uh, your article on it. The NFC is just horrific. It was there's no way that that's going to So. Um, and uh, you know, moving more into uh, your your political view, you, you spoke about several times how your your views have evolved through time. What led about that change? Just being in a college atmosphere, or was it just reading or a class? Or how did that happen? Yeah, how I uh, originally started getting into politics. Well, I mean, I've always I find it to be absolutely hysterical. So, growing up, I always watched the Daily Show on Comedy Central with John Stewart. And, well, that, that, that started, uh, it was a struggle where I got my political information. After that, I knew I needed to get uh, a broader view of it, so I did my own reading. And, I guess, being conservative as far as my views never really appealed to me. I, I wouldn't. Exactly sure what they're trying to concern her. Or you believe that everybody should have the, the right to do what they want as long as it doesn't you know, harm anybody else. So today my views are a little more libertarian. Than and uh, you're uh, also originally from Eastern North Carolina, right? Close to Eastern North Carolina, kind of. I mean, I, I know I've seen. On a map, is like sort of ish. Yeah, we're, we're west of I ninety five. Is that enough to be East North Carolina? Yeah, for uh, those listening that aren't familiar with North Carolina politics, 
pretty much everything that's outside the triangle, which is Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, that's the triangle, research triangle. That's extremely, extremely liberal. I won't say as far as being progressive, but compared to the rest of North Carolina, which is pretty much solid red. And all those other areas are pretty liberal. And if you go go closer to eastern North Carolina, eastern edge, you probably are even more likely to be exposed to a conservative environment. Um, and that's where I originally from the area of Craven County and Newburgh. Yeah, yeah, that's that's all. And so it's if if you don't say if for example if you are because when I was in high school I, I didn't define as anything so just to but even I mean some people that were like four or five of them in my high school would say they're Democrat yeah that's getting your yeah you got a lot of crap for that there's a lot of things still at least for coming on yeah yeah I don't for example there's a lot of Trump supporters who say yeah I think Trump Sometimes says fat, well, sometimes says it. Trump often says fascist things that I can definitely prove are exactly the same things that Hitler proposed. People will get on you as like, and all these things, and screaming about all the and stuff like that, or ISIS and all that. Like, none of that's factual. <laughs> Nothing you just said to me was a fact. I don't know. I'm not a, I mean, that's just being honest, having to cover politics and living in the area for uh, my entire life. That's just what happened. That's just some background for the listener. So when someone says, in this area that, hey, I read some things and exposed myself to different ideas, and I don't think Christian philosophy, or not, not conservative philosophy, all the times, um, is incorrect, or I don't agree with all this, you kind of get a sideways view, and I'm sure you, you know where I'm coming from with that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's weird, though. You come... Uh, you know, when family comes first, or you accept family and all that stuff, but as soon as you happen to disagree with the viewpoint, it's not cast out. Right? Yeah, that's sometimes... Uh, you're just, uh, cast out? Mm -hmm. So I think you're trying to say that it, it affects them in the Kind of uh, just a, just in a, a negative way. It kind of seems like you're almost like taking away part of their heart since you agree to disagree with them on something. Yeah, well, I was gonna say that, um, if you uh, yeah, I'm aware. yeah, I, I think I know what you're trying to say with that is because because I, I disagree with my parents on certain things, and it, it is like. Uh, uh, why don't you think like that, or how would you get that opinion? And, it, and a lot of it comes from sometimes this uh, disagreeing with um, outlooks on praying and whatnot. I don't have anything against those that pray, but in certain situations, I'm going. And one of them that always gets me is I agree with asthma, and that I, I would be dead if not for doctors. And when someone says pray, uh, pray, thank, thank God that you're still alive, I'm like. Can't we at least acknowledge the doctors who kept me alive? If you want to say that they got that ability from a higher power, then fine. But we can't just ignore them because they actually actively did it. And that, that's kind of where I get my a little a little weird with the religion is when it gets brought into things like that. Like people who want to deny climate change or other things based on faith healers, you don't want to take your kids to doctors because they want to pray and have a miracle healing. It's things like that. It's like, you know, you're literally spitting in the face of food and science because of a faith in that endangers a lot of people. And that's where uh, I get more issues, like some issues with things like that. I don't have any problem with having a much more belief that it hurts other people or it gets me killed or, or they can die. That's kind of where I have a Yeah, absolutely. Very much. And um, are you paying close attention to the uh, presidential election right now? Uh, I do as much as I can. Uh, I currently don't have cable, so everything I, I pick up on is just put on. Uh, what are your opinions of what Iowa was? I remember recording said that was just last night. What are your opinions of the races right now and everything that's been happening, especially with Trump and all the headlines? 
All I've got to say is, if the Republicans end up losing, which is going to happen, they have no one to blame but themselves. Because the best foot they can put forward to, you know, combat Trump is, and that's just pretty pathetic in itself. Um, as far as the Democratic side, I, I've been a, a Bernie supporter for about 10 months now. Um, and I think, I think he's got a youth vote to bring the momentum going forward. And I think ultimately he's going to come out with the, at least the Democratic nomination, if not the presidency. Yeah, it's, this, with our millennial age group, it seems, this because he's speaking about things that we directly either are going through or just went through college debt, college loans, and all these things that I don't really remember in my life being a politician ever even acknowledging. Running for the presidency, to be honest with you, I I can't really remember. It might have been just a thing for saying, "Hey, we got to do something about this." But let's talk about. It. I mean, that's kind of how it was. This is kind of he's running on, and that's why I think a lot of the older people on the left, uh, more establishment Democrats, have been different issues. Like, why, why is he talking about these things? Why, why this doesn't matter. It's like it, it, it does a little bit. I mean, it affects all of us. And that stuff affects the economy because with our with our generation, it's we've we've seen in the job markets like oh, all these things are going to corporations. This isn't this isn't exactly how this should. Be. <laughs> but uh, that's where I, that's where I think a lot of people ignore Bernie because of, they don't see it or they don't know anyone that's directly doing it. Well, me personally, I think. Uh, I come from a long line of teachers, so education is a big part of my politics. Like that's what I really care about. And none of the politics, no other politics that come to mind is actually put that uh, as a part of his platform. Especially when he's talking about free college. Well, if he can do anything to knock off my student loans, yeah, I'm gonna vote for him. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of millennials feel. It's like, wait a minute, he, he, said, he said what? He's going to do what about college? He's going to do what about our love? I mean, yeah, that's honestly how it, that's how it's going. Anyway, he said he's, I mean, there's a lot of things he's, he's you know, progressive ideas he's coming up with. Uh, he wants to take money out of politics, which honestly, anyone paying a little attention understands that money in politics is a huge problem. And that's kind of why. I get bothered by some things that he says because it's so disingenuous when she literally just got received two hundred fifty thousand dollars for speech for investment banks. And I mean, like you're, you can't say you're going to be tough on politics or a tough, tough on corporations, big banks, when you're quite busy. No, that doesn't happen. You know, any stretch of the so I mean, that's where I, I get my biggest problems. Which is not that authentic. And Bernie, uh, he. What he says, I mean, you can look through his track record, and I, his ideas personally, I his track record, everything he's saying, you can look and go through his 40, 50 something years of politics, and he's been saying the same thing since then. And that's, I think that's what's appealing to a lot of people, why, or why uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll keep doing these things. It's a right? We're going through the same thing again. And yeah, that's I mean, just uh, that's kind of how and what you said about Trump and Republicans, it's it really it's alarming because of what he because the things he has he said he said said of course since like last August have been so out there that I honestly thought multiple times, oh, that's going to hurt him because that's me. why is he rising? He just said basically he, he basically alluded to that every single undocumented worker coming from Mexico is a rapist or a baby killer or did something illegal to her. Then he basically said, oh, we're going to treat all Muslims like they were Jews and get registrations. Like seriously, like I I don't understand where some people believe or how they can rationalize the that this is a good idea. And these are the same people who also claim that they're constitutional scholars and they're college. And we'll say that if we know the Constitution 
and build a thing that kind of says, like, what part of that do you find in the Constitution? Like, that's completely, that's a pretty great ripping up the Constitution and lighting it on fire. So, uh, yeah, I believe you're 100% right when you say that, because I, I myself. <laughs> And, uh, in a, is there anything else that you're currently working on? Because I know, uh, we're going to get back with the, uh, the magazine coming up shortly again. And is there anything else that you're working on that you want to talk about? And, um, I'm going to have your Twitter, uh, at the bottom of the screen, YouTube, so I'll have that there. Is there anything else you want to talk about that you're doing? Right. I'm working on an article with, uh, the closing of the an expanded uh, playoff system for college football. Uh, so we've had our, we've had two years under the 14 playoffs so far, but it, yeah, me personally, I would love to see more teams get the opportunity to play for a national championship. I think there's a lot of teams that could have uh, competed for them, competed well. So, by the way, I think four, uh, three, four years down the line, it's, the uh, playoff committee will be open up to will be open to expanding it because it's so much more money in their pocket when it comes down to it. Yeah, FCS, uh, FCS has been doing it right for about decades. <laughs> they do it right in big boy football game. You know, I honestly think that if they were to move that system, though, again, like you said, more money, it's more fun to watch. Kind of tired of seeing an SEC versus someone every single time. But, <laughs> I mean, if you're not, you know, if you're not going to an SEC school, it's kind of like, oh, yay, okay. because because it's how powerful the conference it is and how it's rated. But like, yeah, if you win the FCC, at the SEC, and you have one or two, one loss or, or undefeated, yeah, you're going to go to that championship game. But that kind of gets old. I don't know. Because years ago, it was when Boise State was really not losing a game. It would have been great to have seen Boise State to see them go up against a team like Alabama. I mean, that's that's like the perfect story of underdog against dominant power. And that was when Kellen Moore was when Can Kellen Moore beat Alabama? But, you know, just how uh, Peterson was with the way he calls games and his creativity, that would have been amazing to watch what trick he would try to pull out to try to win the game like that. I mean, that's kind of stuff that I think college football is about and why it can at times be a lot of fun. The NFL because you don't see that kind of risky play in the NFL. That's it's more conservative. Yeah, we love uh, center of stories and Mark Madden. Mark Madden had the same I agree 100%. And uh, again, uh, it was great talking to you. Uh, and anyway, definitely uh, look forward to having you back sometime in the uh, future. And uh, again, and, and everyone that was at uh, uh, the end. And, uh, We'll be right back at this commercial break. Thank you, John.